Greetings and good evening to all. Welcome to the 62nd episode of Analytics Wednesday on combating fraud using analytics. These Wednesday webinar series are brought to you by SAMA Audit Systems and Software's Private Limited, Bombay, and it is supported by the Government of Canada Trade Commissioner Service. SAMA Audit Systems and Software's Private Limited has, over the last two decades, developed a very enviable position and a very strong base in tools and solutions which support the audit, accountancy, investigation, compliance community. Great. I just got a confirmation. So we've uh, got a wonderful base in audit analytics. That's our flagship product case where idea. Thank you for the confirmation. We also have caseware working papers, Alisa for continuous monitoring. We've got Lex Comply for legal compliance management, and we've, we are working with wonderful organizations for the last two decades. Now, coming down to the topic for today, com combating fraud using analytics, uh, I have something very special for all of you all. Uh, I've got a lot of interesting case studies, which I'm going to be presenting to you all. And let me start off with a bit of an introduction and a premise to the topic. Uh, we've looked at the last four years. It's been a, it's been a very significant health uh, disruption to all of us. Many of us lost loved ones because of the COVID pandemic. Now, the reason I'm drawing a parallel to today's webinar session and the COVID pandemic is today's topic, combating fraud using analytics has a very important matter at the heart of it, which is basically red flags. Red flags give out and help investigators and auditors identify frauds which are either underway or about to happen. In the same way, if you look at the pandemic, the pandemic and you know anyone who was infected with COVID would give out red flags, like say, uh, you know, difficulty in breathing, high fever, you know, muscle debilitation, general malaise. So it's these flags, these indicators, which help us help the medical community identify people who had COVID along with the COVID test. In fact, I read recently that they've got an artificial intelligence solution, which based on the type of cough, the COVID cough is very unique. That artificial intelligence solution can actually with a 95% accuracy predict if someone has COVID just on the type of the cough. So now I am linking that to our topic for today because data analytics is the solution. It is the mechanism through which we are able to identify these red flags and these red flags when tied together can help us identify frauds which are underway or frauds which are in the process of being which may get perpetrated because of certain weaknesses in the system now i read recently and these are surveys which are reported again and again every year whether it's by the association of certified fraud examiners whether it's the oecd the united nations uh, the, the World Bank, IMF, they all talk about the fact that largely frauds, organized economic financial crimes are detected only after 380 to 400 days of the crime being perpetrated, the fraud being perpetrated. And at that time, almost 85 to 90% of the proceeds are irrecoverable. So the challenge we face is, are we doing enough on the technology front, not to prevent frauds because data analytics cannot prevent frauds, but it can reduce the detection time of frauds. So the entire webinar today is being arranged to demonstrate to you through use cases that what are the kind of red flags in different processes which can be identified with the help of data analytics. And today, we are not looking at a very sanitized, structured environment where someone's giving you a Microsoft Excel file in a sanitized, structured manner where the data is completely sanitized. We are looking at an environment where you have data from disparate 
systems. I remember we were working on an investigation for a very large manufacturing company in the north of India, where they were suspecting certain uh, uh, members from the commercial team who, for receiving kickbacks from the vendors. So they passed on that information to us and they said, can you use data analytics to confirm uh, what we are suspecting? Now, we had to think out of the box. We not only st studied their employee claims, but we went out of the box and we looked at their mobile data records. And we looked at their travel records and the claim records. So you'll notice one thing here that we were not looking at only the travel claims data or the employee claims data from Oracle or SAP or Tally, but we were looking at their mobile bills. So what we actually did is that the mobile bills for the suspect employees was in the form of PDF files. The travel claims data, the attendance data, which showed that they were traveling on these particular days was in different systems in different file formats. So we used idea to bring in the PDF data, the mobile bills, the attendance data, the travel claims data, which was in a delimited file, an Excel file. And we identified that the suspect employees, they were having a pattern every Sunday, they would travel to certain cities by certain flights. And when they reached in those cities, they would by design call certain numbers. So we were able to study this through the call data records in the mobile bills. Now, how do we know that they were calling those suspect vendors who were giving them kickbacks because we linked the mobile number to whom the calls were going and the call data records with the vendor master. So there's a fourth file here, which is the vendor master. So you can actually see in this example, it's not a straight cut single file case. There are four data sets which are being linked together. And through this, we are building up literally like a crime scene investigation. We're doing a 360 degree profiling of a potential fraud. And we are coming out with a very convincing, supporting, irrefutable charge that, yes, these employees have received kickbacks, right? Because they were calling those vendors and then based on that, the evidence we gathered that they were routinely calling those vendors, they were... We were able to, they were staying in those hotels. They had certain items they were ordering every time. So, you know, there was a fixed pattern. And if you study the theory of fraud, a fraudster always leaves back certain predictability in their activities. So, friends, the way I have structured my presentation is, just give me a minute. Let me just uh, close this background banner. I'm going to be presenting a number of use cases to you all for the next 25 to 30 minutes. And then I'm going to keep time for question and answers. Now, my case studies are going to target not only different business processes. And I'm while there are different data analytic tools you can use, because we uh, work with the idea closely, uh, my team, Saurabh, Abhijit, me, we work with the idea. And many of you who've signed on online are also idea users. I prefer to use idea, but in no ways are we saying that it's only idea which can be used to bust frauds. You can use any tool of your choice. So what I intend to do is through these use cases, cover practical challenges, like how do we work with multiple data sets? How do we work with unstructured data? How do we work where the data needs to be cleansed? How do we work where there are genuine and deliberate typographical errors in text fields, right? So all this I'm going to cover through case studies and uh, I, I look forward to a lot of comments and inputs from you once I finish my uh, presentation of these case studies. So now friends, let's begin with something which probably a few of you know that in the more recent versions of IDEA, what Caseware Idea Inc. Canada has done is they've added in a feature called Discover, which allows us as auditors and investigators the ability to leverage pre-built analytics through machine intelligence tests. So Discover, which I'm going to be showing you now, is a feature which allows you to identify at the click of a button 
anomalies, patterns, outliers, red flags, without us having to apply our own mind on the data. We just get the data in, click the discover button and we get a lot of insights. Now, while I tend to use a lot of manufacturing and trading data, I'm going to depart from it. And I'm going to show you some data from a banking and financial institution, which will kind of lend a bit of a, no, uh, you know, a novelty to our session this evening. So I have with me, okay, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you all are able to view my screen. Uh, I have with me a uh, loan portfolio management data right for a bank financial institution uh, that's in the form of a simple microsoft excel file okay so i drag this file and i drop it in idea software and i import the data so now this data uh, just give me a minute let me yeah this data contains information like all of us bank uh, we have current accounts, checking accounts, savings account, loans, deposits with our banks. This data basically contains loans data. We have the borrower details, the type of loan they've availed, what was the limit, what was the amount outstanding, what is the rate of interest, tenure, when did they last pay an installment, all of this information is available. Now, without us having to apply our thought on the analytic, let's see what the software can give to us. So, we use this feature called discover and at the click of a button, a lot of interesting uh, patterns, trends, outliers, dashboards get generated, which allow us to kind of paint a picture, tell a story, examine red flags. It's all about examining what could be going wrong in the data. As I talked about the crime scene and investigation case, connecting dots and trying to see whether a number of factors are resulting in a problem in the data. Now, if you actually look at what's come up on the screen, this is the output which is rendered through Discover. Now, on this loan portfolio management data, you can actually see loans have been advanced on a Sunday. Right? There are duplicate customer references. There are loans where the interest rate is zero. There are loans where the installment amount are zero. And I kid you not, I haven't configured this report for the purpose of this webinar. These are getting automatically generated. I can see four red flags right away on my screen within a, a, a few seconds. I can see duplicate customer IDs. I can see loans advanced on a Sunday, approved on a Sunday, disbursed on a Sunday. Interest rate, zero interest rate, zero installment amounts. So all of these are giving certain displaying, revealing certain red flags. to, And what's nice is it's not only the count I'm seeing there. If I click on it, I'm able to drill down. I'm able to deep dive and look at the entries, which come, you know, comprise of those 28 Sunday disbursements or sanctions. So this is a very good starting point where we, uh, even if you're doing an investigation and we want to get off the block, like I was, you know, uh, you know, it's the cricket season going on and everyone's been talking about uh, the performance of certain uh, senior cricketers. So they all have this anxiety that I need to score runs and get off the block. I need to be, I need to be, I shouldn't be getting out on a duck. In the same way, as investigators, we need to have something coming up right away when we use the data analytic tool. I, 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 I need not wait for a couple of days to get the result. I should get something right away and discover ensures that happens. So this is a very nice feature. And I believe that at the moment, these are four independent red flags, duplicate custom IDs, items on a Sunday, a zero interest rate, zero installment amounts. But is there a way I can tie these four red flags together where it tells me this customer ID is coming in all the four red flags? Then that is what we call 360 degree red flag risk profiling because one customer ID is appearing in all the four red flags. So that's, I believe, a feature which is going to be coming up in the Idea Lab very shortly, where we will be able to tie all of these red flags together, right? So stay connected. We will be able to update you on that. Now, I, I'll keep moving, uh, friends, so that I can cover maximum activities. Now, other than the Discover feature, I'm still on pre-built analytics. I'm still on you know, getting a ready-made representation of red flags. Now, another activity which is very, very interesting is vendor payments. In the P2P cycle, in the procure-to-pay cycle, 
we examine vendor payments very closely because there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, frauds which come out in vendor payments. So I have with me uh, a vendor payments dump. Let me locate the file. That's again an Excel file. I drag it and I drop it to IDEA. And uh, this file has uh, both vendor payments and it also has release limits for uh, different uh, approvers within the system, right? So I have typical information like payments made to vendors against uh, different bills, using different instrument numbers on different payment dates, having different purchase orders, and that's the release limit of the authorizer. I also have the authorizer's approval limits in a secondary file. So you can see here, we are already having a scenario where we have two files with us and we need to kind of identify a red flag with two files. So what I would like to do is identify suspicious or suspect vendor payments. Now, for all the members online, when we talk about suspicious or suspect vendor payments, it could mean a duplicate vendor payment, a split vendor payment, a payment to a one-time vendor, a payment in advance, a payment without a purchase order, right? Or a payment to a blacklisted vendor. We understand as auditors, different dimensions of a suspect vendor. But can the tool help us identify suspect vendor payments, right? So it comes down to we not exercising our bias or prejudice, but the tool very independently giving us that information. So what we do here is we use the very, very famous and popular Benford's law. Now, Benford's law, in my opinion, is a very powerful framework to do exploratory analytics, right? It may not tell you that there's a fraud exactly in this voucher, but it will point the way in the direction of something which could be going wrong. So I apply Benford's law on the field amount, right? And I run the test on the last two digits because I'm looking at, say, amounts which are ending with very, very suspicious integers like a 49 or a 79, an 89 or a 99. So I can go to the suspicious last two digits test and uh, need to make certain settings in the data, right? Where I run it not on the decimals, but on the actual integers. And when I run this, what it does is it gives me a very powerful visual representation of suspicious vendor payment. So if you look at that Benford graph or chart, which has got displayed, the figures in blue are all my normal permissible, allowable within range payments. But the ones in red are the potential suspicious payments which need to be examined. So if I see this payment in the center and I say uh, extract and display the suspicious payment, it gives me, that's the best part about the tool. It'll, it'll scan thousands of line items and it gives me very specific uh, transactions which need to be reviewed and investigated. So if you look at the data, you can actually see the last two payments. They are suspicious because the vendor names are different, but the vendor code is the same. So it could mean it's a payment to a one-time vendor, which needs to be studied closely. If you look at the first, let's say, four payments, these payments are made to uh, the same supplier. So no problem with that. But if you scroll to the right-hand side, you can see they are all against the same bill. Running check numbers, same payment date, same purchase order, same approvers. You can see so many data points are same and the amounts are also the same ending with 49. So it kind of, you know, gives a alert and the narration is blank. So that further compounds the red flag that further adds to the credibility of your reporting of the red flag. But it doesn't end here. If you look at these payments, they are all approved by HMB. And if I open the limit file for HMB, I can see HMB can pass payments up to 100,000. And if you look at the payments, they all are designed to stay just below 100,000. 
So I've been able to even identify splitting of payments, which is what was my original plan when I look for suspect vendor payments. So just keep one thing in mind that Discover and Benford's Law are two very good mechanisms, techniques, which can help us identify uh, suspicious entries, red flags in the data. Now, uh, if you have any questions, friends, you can either put them into the chat or the Q&A while my presentation is going on, or you can even raise them right at the end uh, in the next uh, 20 odd minutes. Now, let's look at data which is unstructured, unsanitized, unformatted. So the files I showed you so far, they were very structured data. What if I have unstructured data? So I have with me from an IT security, IT information technology forensic point of view, a data set which is basically a firewall log file. Okay. Now this is a report file. And if I kind of import and extract this into idea, you'll notice something very alarming or suspicious on the data. So remember one thing, whenever you are doing an investigation, anyone who wants to hide a misdemeanor or a mistake or an error anomaly or a fraud in the data, they'll try to throw you off guard by giving you data, which is very difficult to analyze. So if you see this data, the first thing which comes to your mind is that there is no column heading. The data points do not have headings. The data points are not having a uniform starting and ending point. It's almost like a zigzag pattern in the data. So when I examine this data, the first challenge I face is how am I going to capture data which is unstructured and unformatted? So what I'm able to do here, and then this is thanks to the brilliance of the technical teams and the product teams in Caseware Idea Canada, that I am able to capture unstructured, unformatted data. So I use a process here. Just give me a minute. I think I chose the standard layer. I need to go for a floating layer, right? And uh, here I am able to set a, a, what we basically called a trap. And you'll notice here, uh, friends, that when I'm actually choosing the data this way, right? You can see this, that the data is not getting captured correctly. So let me just uh, kind of set the fields uh, first. So I'm choosing the access date. I'm choosing the IP address, okay? And uh, what I'm also doing, uh, just give me a minute, everyone. Uh, I need to ensure that I'm capturing the website uh, uh, visited. Okay. So I just need to ensure that I'm doing that correctly. Give me a minute. Okay. I'll probably come back to this a bit later. Okay. So you'll notice here that I've been able to select the fields like this. Okay. Right. But the challenge here is that the data is not getting captured correctly. So what I'm able to do here is by, because it's a floating activity, by putting a special character between the fields, I'm able to format the data. So that challenge which the fraudster or the perpetrator puts on me as an investigator can be overcome by using this technique of a floating uh, import layer. And when I import this, right, you'll notice that I'm able to get all the information I want. So I'm getting the, it's just coming up on the screen. I'm getting the IP address. I'm getting the date. You'll notice that uh, I, I've also got some special characters at the end because I took one extra selection, but I'm able to get the information in a very structured, sanitized manner. On this file, I wanted to actually show you that this is the Excel version of the file, right? You can see this. So if I want to now check from an IT security, IT forensic point of view, that has anyone accessed any prohibited sites, 
right? Any sites which are blacklisted, which are not on the white list, uh, maybe competitor websites, maybe websites where there's a chance that you may attract malware, harmful content. How do we look for employees, you know, compromising the internal network by visiting those sites? So what you can do here is we move away from the pre-built analytics and we can actually search for uh, content in the data to prohibited sites. So we have a search command here where we can actually say, look for the site, say poker or sites containing the word uh, gambling, right? So, you know, I can add in any number of uh, sites here. So I keep adding in the strings I'm looking for. And I say, look for these words in the field portal and create a separate database. So I call it, let's say, a uh, harmful URL access. You know, I give it a suitable file name, run the test, and you can actually see it's giving me a list of sites with the word gambling. So not only can I use the tool from a financial forensic point of view, I can also use it from an IT forensic point of view. Uh, there are a couple of questions which have come in. Let me take them uh, as, uh, uh, yes, Olizi, there will be a video recording which would be on the SAMA YouTube channel and you can access that tomorrow morning. Uh, there's a chat from Vivek where he's mentioned Sahara is a classic example of flooding the auditor with a lot of data and a lot of irrelevant data, but you needed a real smart auditor to identify, uh, you know, data which uh, can be used in the investigation. Uh, Ram Rutan has said, is there any function in Excel that, that can be used to carry out such analysis? Uh, Ram Rutan, I'm sure if you look for this on, uh, there are a lot of YouTube content on uh, the internet, which will talk about these functions. And I'm sure if you Google it, you'll get a lot of this content in Excel. Uh, and uh, it will help you with your forensic investigations. Now, uh, covering some more use cases, uh, friends, when we basically uh, have to look at, let's say, uh, conflict of interest or a segregation of duties test, right? So I have with me a data, which is basically uh, like a vendor master data dump. Okay. So I'm going to bring in uh, this data and do idea. Now, what this data uh, contains is uh, vendor master details. It contains information, whether it's a staff account or a, a, an internal uh, employee or an external vendor. You can see there's a field called staff flag where it's N, it would mean it's an external vendor. If it's Y, it means it's an internal employee. And we've got the vendor name. We've got the approver name. We've got details like uh, the... Uh, permanent account number, that's the income tax registration number. Now, one of the tests we all do, so I want to show you two things here is, uh, you know, from a, from a vendor employee nexus point of view, we all work for organizations where uh, an employee cannot masquerade as a vendor. It's a conflict of interest. And we need to identify that. So if my master data contains both the employee data and the vendor data in a single file, I can split the data and then link the data together. Now I'm going to show you something very interesting. Okay. So I'm going to split the data first. So I use this feature called the key value where I can split the data based on the staff flag. So you can see it's either giving me an N, which would mean it's a vendor or a Y, which would mean it's a staff account. I run the two. And uh, I get two files, one which contains, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. One which contains the vendor data and one which contains the staff data. Now, I want to link it. So I can link it based on the mobile number, the bank account number, the income tax registration number. So we use uh, typically uh, like a join command here, which is like a VLOOKUP. And Ram Rutan, this is, you uh, mean, you know, an input to you that if you want to do this in Excel, you can use a VLOOKUP in Excel to link the two files. So we link the vendor master with the staff master. And the common field in uh, our example is, let's say, the phone number. So I'm going to do the map on the phone number. Okay. So I'll call this uh, vendor staff nexus on, uh, let's say, phone number. So when I run this, you can actually see we are getting one case of a vendor, uh, Kiran Kumar, 
okay where you can actually see kiran kumar is a vendor and having a mobile number 989333 uh, and also a staff member having the very same mobile number so it's it's very interesting that we are able to identify this nexus based on the mobile number now you'll agree with me that fraudsters are not this naive or gullible they are going to make it difficult for us so our mobile numbers are very sanitized field what they do is they play with uh, you know a lot of typographical data they'll change the spellings they'll change the grammatical variations so and they'll they'll put different mobile numbers different bank account numbers so now what i want to show you is how do we map the data when the names are not the same but they are similar so we use a very interesting technique and idea called a fuzzy duplicate which is a pattern match now when we use a fuzzy duplicate right what we are able to do is we are able to look for similar sounding vendor names okay so i'm i'm putting that in there in the key field vendor names and uh, we can set the pattern match or the similarity degree on the data so it could vary from a 60% to a 99% we set that uh, pattern match so uh, i believe now in the newer versions of excel you can also set the pattern match in excel so i'm going to keep it let's say at the default uh, uh, 80 odd percent and now when i run the test you'll notice something very interesting uh let me very specifically show you line number 4 and 5 okay line number 4 and 5 you can see the star flag is y and n which means one is a vendor and the other is an employee and if you look at the vendor names the names are very similar to one another so what it's done is the income tax number the bank number the mobile number the postal code nothing is matching so if we did a traditional match on those fields we would get zero red flags but because we did the pattern match on the vendor name we are able to identify similar sounding vendor names and this allows us to identify nexus based on pattern matching and the same thing can be done in the master data friends on the vendor name and the approver name so if i would like to check for a conflict of interest where i have approved an account where i onboard someone with a name similar to my name but i make a minor variation to the customer name or the vendor name how do we identify those cases so the earlier activity where we did a pattern match was within a particular data point or of within a field now what i'm going to show you is how do we do a pattern match across fields so we've got we can do a simple extraction i call this pattern match across fields okay and you can actually see the versatility of these data and it tools that we can use different functionalities to achieve our objective of identifying the red flag and here we've got these stored commands i'm using a command called sounds like okay where i just say does my vendor name pardon me does my vendor name sounds like approver name so i can actually map my vendor name approver name now for all of us who are working in the anti money laundering space you can actually map the customer name with the list of world check database with the pep listing with the blacklisted listing you can actually see whether i'm doing business with a country which is you know uh, uh, blacklisted i'm not supposed to do it and they spelt the country name differently they spelt the city name differently all of that can be done using sounds like so pattern match across columns vendor name approver name let's run this and you can actually see we are getting uh, cases where the names are not the same but they are similar so this adds a lot of credibility a lot of power a lot of functionality to our capability as a forensic investigator because if you did not have this functionality a fraudster would walk away by just making minor variations to the name and we would be caught high and dry now just like this activity friends where we did a conflict of interest test between vendor name and approver name i go back to my vendor payments uh, case study where i'm going to bring in a vendor payments uh, dump once again into idea 
and i want to show you something very interesting in that dump how do we look for duplicate vendor invoices when someone in the vendor payments team has made a minor variation to the vendor invoice they put a special character they've put a space they've made some typo variations to the vendor invoice so that sap oracle or any other erp the internal control does not detect it right because those inbuilt controls are there in the erp so what we do is we are able to add a field into the data okay called vendor invoice cleaned so we are actually uh, cleaning up the vendor invoice we are getting it rid of spaces special characters right and we use these commands within the data analytic tool which allow us to strip and capitalize the letter so you can either capitalize it upper case lower case sentence case no problem but what you do here is using the strip command you are able to remove spaces and special characters and we run this on the field uh vendor invoice number which in my data is called external document number so it removes spaces and special characters and now what i do is i do a duplicate check on my data okay but i don't do it on my original bill number field which has come from the erp i do it on the field vendor invoice clean which i have added now using the strip command and i also do it on the amount field so i choose a list of fields click on uh, uh, okay let me remove any blanks in the data there could be some blank invoice number so let me remove any false positives and now if i run this test you'll see something very interesting give me a minute uh just look at the last three items in the data okay you can actually see the second last column the way the fraudster has used the special characters and spaces in the bill number each bill is given a different distinct identity so if i try to use a pure exact duplicate these would never get captured but because i use the strip command i am able to detect these cases there is a question which is coming uh can we give an example in payroll where we can identify a red flag yes ramrutan i am just going to be giving two more examples before i close up and then uh, uh, you know uh, open it up to question and answer so in payroll uh, a very interesting example if i were to show you let me uh, take travel data and i know uh, i'm i'm taking travel data so i would like to take basically uh, attendance data okay uh, just give me a minute i need to make sure i'm using the right file uh, i need to take leave data the leave data is somewhere around here just give me a minute everyone when you need a file you'll never get it and i'm sure you all are able to spot it yeah i got it employee leave data so that's the data file i'm going to be bringing in so ramrutan this is a case which is not payroll exactly but it comes close to it this is the leave data so i have the employee code and the date on which the employee is taken leave and i also have the travel data okay let me bring that in and i hope i don't embarrass myself by missing the file yes the file is there this is the travel report now just like how we looked at red flags in vendor payments we looked at red flags in masters we would uh, we looked at red flags in uh, in uh, uh, ledger data in uh, 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 firewall access log data here we want to identify unauthorized travel claims an unauthorized travel claim is where an employee has traveled on a holiday uh, on a leave date and put in a claim and the company has paid the employee many of us test that so we can actually join or link or do a v look up between the travel data and the leave data and the common field in both the data sets would be the employee number 
and it would also be the travel date from file number one and the leave date from file number two. Classic case, friends. Uh, you remember I spoke about it in, uh, in the introduction to my webinar that we will always be required to cross pollinate. Cross pollinate is bring in data sets from different processes. So I have leave data from attendance. I have travel data from my TNE module. I'm bringing them together and I'm linking them based on the employee code. I'm linking them based on the travel date and the leave date. Now, when I run this, you'll see something very interesting. Claim number, employee number, travel date, town. And from here, the other file, I take the leave date. So when I run this, you can actually see I'm getting cases of employees who've traveled on the leave date, claim the amount, and they've also been given the payment. So this is the kind of red flags, Ramrutan, you can discover in uh, travel data, in attendance data. And finally, the last case study, which I would like to take up uh, before I jump into Q&A, is something which is related to identifying high risk audit units in the data. Now, let me bring in the, the, the data file for this case study and then explain to you what is my objective in identifying the red flag. So I have two data sets, everyone, in this activity. Nowadays, a lot of companies use digitalization, digital media to achieve their objective. So they have digital uh, advertising on their websites to drive traffic to their websites. And a lot of businesses garnered through digital advertising. So I've got digital advertising data and website revenue ticketing done. So let me bring the data together in one file and then I'll tell you what's the red flag I'm looking to identify. I'm gonna join the digital advertising data with the revenue data. And my common field is like the product market segment and the week of the year, which is the time period. So now when I link the data sets together, I have the product market segment, the week, the ad spends and the revenue, which has come out of the digital advertising. Now, what I would like to check, and then I'll give you an example of where we use this for a leading IT services company and discovered a fraud. I would like to check as an investigator, if I'm spending more on digital advertising, my uh, revenue should be increasing. The number of accounts I open should be increasing. The number of contracts should be increasing. I should be doing more business, basically. I want to check where I'm spending more on advertising, but I'm getting a falling revenue trend. And that's a concern. So we use a very, very famous, popular, powerful tool called correlation, where we correlate the online ad spends with the revenue. And we generate the correlation score for every product market segment. Now, when we do this, the tool is so powerful. It immediately in a few seconds tells us, hey, look here, guys, product A market B has a negative correlation. You need to deep dive into this particular segment and study the segment. So if I go into product A market B, put a filter on that and visually try to understand what's going wrong in the data, you'll see something very interesting. Okay. Let me show you what could be going wrong. You can actually see the reason it's identified product A market B as an area of concern, a high risk audit unit, because my advertising is on a rise. You can see the blue bar, but my revenue, which should come through the advertising is on a fall. And this is where a feature like correlation allows us to identify such high risk audit units. Now, friends, before I jump into Q&A, I wanted to end up my presentation by giving you a very interesting articulation of where we use correlation for a leading IT services company. We, uh, as many of you know, uh, IT services company, they have project sites across the world, in the Americas, in Africa, in the Middle East, in, in Southeast Asia, and they deploy engineers on their site. So when they deploy an engineer, the number of hours the engineers put on the site in various roles and capacities is built to the customer at different dollar rates per hour or per day. It would depend on the contract. So we basically took 
two data sets from the revenue application and the attendance application project wise project wise we correlated the revenue data with the manpower deployment data and we identified out of around 275 project sites across the world about 10 project sites where manpower deployment at the sites was increasing over a year month wise but the revenue was dropping something like what you see here in advertising and sales and when we actually deep when the investigation team actually visited that particular those countries those project sites they identified that fictitious engineers were being randomly assigned to project sites okay and Naturally, if they are fictitious engineers, they are not going to be doing any revenue contribution. And this came out through the correlation feature. The government of India also, the Control Auditor General of India, that's the Supreme Audit Institution of India who uses IDEA software. They, and I can mention this because it's on the public domain, they used IDEA in the midday meal scheme in India, in Maharashtra, in our state, to identify schools where the number of children enrolling for the school are coming down, but the midday meals are going up. Costs. And they identified the contractors were adding fictitious students into the roles and claiming higher inflated food bills from the state government. So these are some examples I wanted to give you all. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, Olizu, I mentioned it earlier also. You will be... The, the video recording for the session will be available on the SAMA Audit YouTube channel tomorrow morning and you can access it there. So friends, uh, I wanted to keep about five to 10 minutes for question and answers. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A and I'll be happy to take them up. So we have a couple of minutes. Uh, please go ahead, raise your questions. I'm sure you will be uh, quite uh, excited about the topic as uh, you know i've been delivering it to you today any questions or any comments i can see a questions in uh, ramrutan uh, i'm just going to share my email id with all of you all and uh, you can put an email to me at the end of the webinar or maybe tomorrow and i'll be happy to answer questions on commercials offline uh, so there's a question from rajesh can you demonstrate how to use the discover feature just one minute under different x and y axis data so rajesh the discover feature is not linked to the axis it's linked to a normal data set. You're confusing the chart and graph with Discover. They are very different. Discover works on a data set having multiple data points. There's no X and Y axis data there. You just bring in the data, click on Discover. And if the red flag exists in the data, it will kind of give you that red flag on the screen. There's a question from uh, uh, Uliuzi. How would you know the right tool to you to you use for your investigation on idea? Uh, I'm not very sure on that question, Ulizi. Maybe you can put your question to me in email tomorrow. Uh, I'm not very sure on the framing of your question. You can just put it to me on email tomorrow. Are there any other questions? Uh, friends, this video will be available on the SAMA Audit YouTube channel tomorrow. There are 61 videos relating to 61 uh, webinars which we've had in the past all on the SAMA YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shivkumar, for your valuable inputs. You've always attended all the 62 webinars and thank you for your feedback and your inputs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your insights, inputs, your positive comments and feedback. Uh, So if there's no further question, I'd like to thank all of you for taking out time to attend today's session. Uh, just one minute. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rajesh. And uh, 
we really appreciate you being with us every wednesday we look forward to having you with us uh, on the coming wednesday for yet another insightful and engaging analytics webinar series sure ramrutan will share future webinar details with you uh, so wish you all a wonderful evening ahead and a great day ahead if you are uh, to the west of us and if you are to the east of us uh, good night so thanks a lot for attending the webinar today and uh, we will be uh, thank you for your patronage good evening everyone bye